<laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Is there anything left for me to say? <laughs> Oh, this, this is wonderful. It's wonderful to be among friends with our, my family and for a good reason, to promote the cause of liberty in a revolutionary spirit. Thank you very much for being here. I, I have to tell you, though, I was pretty worried the early part of this week saw a couple of bad articles. I saw it wasn't the hurricane that I was worried about, but I saw that it said revolution is over. There's going to be no revolution. <laughs> Major paper in Washington D.C. They said the revolution will not be happening. <laughs> Don't they only wish? <laughs> But it is, it is so great to come together for something so important. You know, a lot of people say today is a very important day, and I think it is. Our events today, to me, very important. And they say that this uh, convention, very important this week, and indeed it is. And this uh, election is very important. But let me tell you, there's something even more important than all of that, and that is the cause that we're leading and the cause of liberty, the ascension that we're getting right now. There's been a lot of talk about uh, whether or not I would get to speak at the convention. And of course, I've, uh, I've written that off, but today I was very excited. I got a call, a call from the RNC. And they said they changed their mind. And, um, and they're gonna give me a whole hour, I can say anything I want. Tomorrow night. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> First off, I really want to recognize our delegates, uh, hundreds. I don't know how many, but thank you, thank you. <laughs> Takes a lot of hard work, and uh, you, you knew the rules better than they thought they knew the rules. But, you know, that didn't stop them. They've learned how to bend rules, break rules, and now they want to rewrite the rules. But then again, maybe they've been paying attention to what's been going on in Washington. They've been bending in rules and breaking the rules and rewriting the rules for too long. That's what we have to stop from happening. You know, People at the convention were worried uh, just how much uh, trouble we would cause, and uh, you generally have known what my advice is, just stopping something for the sake of stopping doesn't achieve a whole lot, so I've been a little bit cautious. But uh, what they have uh, found out is they've overstepped the bound. There's a big fight going on, and we're involved in it, but everybody else, a bunch of them are joining us and saying, you've gone too far, the Ron Paul people were right about overstepping their bounds. You know, it's, it's, it's just been great, the experience I've had these last five years, and it's been a very important time, not only for me personally, but I, I think for the attention that we're getting. Now, I have received a, a, a lot of compliments about it and given some credit about it, but I tell you what, it takes you, it takes a lot of other people, there's been a lot of things going on for decades, and it's coming about. It's coming about, not so much, not only because I believe we're right on the issues, but what is coming out right now is proof positive that their philosophy of government, whether it's foreign policy, monetary policy, or economic policy, is failing and they need something different. I 
I have often quoted, uh, you know, Victor Hugo about a, a or a, a Adam Samuel Adams about an irate tireless minority, and uh, bringing about changes in that way. But ultimately, that minority is irate and tireless, and and they, uh, you know, light the fires of liberty in the minds of men. Yes, that's important. But ultimately, numbers do count. And even numbers do count when they don't count all the votes as well, because we do have the numbers. But those who, pro those who promote ideas ultimately have to have an influence on the prevailing attitudes of the people. And that is what's happening today. The people now are waking up and they're realizing the failure of what we have and the reason that these ideas are coming about. Now in this primary, we had close to two million votes. They say, oh yeah, there's two million, two million votes. That doesn't swing an election, da da da. You know, uh, it's no big deal, but guess what? For every vote that we got in the primary, let me tell you, just from my personal experience of traveling around the country and meeting people at airports and wherever, the support out there is much, much greater, and they don't feel comfortable coming to a Republican primary. So the support there, I would say, be two or three times as much as the number of votes we got in the primary. We have talked a lot about the uh, excitement uh, that the young people bring, the excitement we've had on the campuses. I asked, I asked somebody on the staff after uh, the last uh, uh, campaign event on a college campus, I said, how many, how many campuses did I go to? And let me tell you, if they had told me I was going to go to this number of campuses during the campaign, I would, probably would have said, there's no way you could do that. We went to 33 college campuses. Talk to talk to close to 150,000 young people, enthusiastic. Were they the conservative college campuses or were they the liberal college campuses? No, they were all the college, college campuses. They welcomed us. Now, when, when you think, if there's a party that says, oh, we have an open tent. We want new people to come in. We want to appeal to the young people. Don't you think they would be begging and pleading that they come into the big tent? Well, well, no, well, we'll get into the tent, believe me, because we will become the tent eventually. Once they know we are the future, they will know about this. But the young people certainly have the en enthusiasm. And I think it's the enthusiasm that really energizes a campaign. It energizes not only themselves and the college campuses, and I've always maintained there will not be a true revolution unless the college campuses are alive and well with those ideas. But there has been so many times that the young people, not only those of voting age, but sometimes 13 and 14 and 15, they bring their parents to the office and, and have them converted into believing and understanding about what liberty is all about. Young people energize a lot of other people and give the energy to the remnant who, believes, who are with us already. So this to me is exciting with the energy that we have. It seems to me that they would be begging and pleading for us to come into the party. You know, most people in this room probably have read that uh, book called 1984. It was required reading in high school uh, uh, for, for so many years. And, uh, you know, I figured it out. I can explain to you where the problem is. Uh, 1984 has been read by a lot, 
I would assume everybody in this room read it as a dire warning of what could happen to a society if you're not careful. I think a bunch of people read the book and thought it was a business plan and they ran for Congress. Because so many claim they read it and uh, they, they claim that they understand this and yet they do the very things that we have been fighting against and trying, uh, trying to stop. During the campaign, I got a lot of advice. Can you believe that? A lot of advice. Sometimes, sometimes from strangers, uh, sometimes from our enemies, sometimes from my family as well. <laughs> but no, the, uh, but the advice that came up from the very well-meaning uh, uh, individuals who were in the category of maybe mainstream Republican and they would come up and say Ron we really like you we like what you're doing and we like what you're saying but if you would only do one thing if you would change one thing boy you would really have a lot more success you need to change your foreign policy <laughs> and of course and of course, if I didn't have this same, the policy that I do have, I don't believe we would be here tonight. <laughs> and, this, and this is something they obviously do not understand. Those who do understand it, fear it because of the uh, powerful special interests behind a foreign policy of intervention in the military industrial complex. So it's complex, but they strongly resent this. But it was mentioned already today, I have mentioned it before, but I think it's the best test of my support coming from, more so than anybody else, from the military for our foreign policy. The subject of monetary policy, of course, comes up frequently in Washington uh, on our committee, but off and on over quite a few years. And the question has always been, what are we going to do, the pen do with the penny? You know, they want to change it to steel, uh, but they can't even afford to steal. If you have a steel penny instead, we can't, we're off the gold, off the silver, we're off the copper standard, now we're on the zinc standard, we're off the, we can't even afford a zinc penny, so that now they want to make them out of steel, but the steel, by the time you pay for labor, it costs more than a penny to make a steel penny. So there was an article, a headline came out the, day, the other day, it said, uh, sh will, can we save the penny? And I got to thinking, well, they don't understand monetary policy or they wouldn't be talking that way. The bigger question that we will be forced to face is can we save the dollar? There was a bill passed not too long ago, and as you could guess, I voted against it, and that's that Dodd-Frank bill. Did you ever hear of that monster? In that bill, they gave more power to the Federal Reserve. It's, uh, they created a board, a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, protect, the, protect all the consumers. So they were given a task here a couple months ago, and it was designed to make things more efficient. That's why th this story will tell you why efficiency is not the answer to our problems. We don't want more efficient government. We want to get the government out of the business that they're not supposed to be doing. But they, this new Consumer Financial Protection Board was given the task of simplifying the applications for a mortgage loan because it's complex. And now they're more complex because they had a bubble and they don't know where the bubble came from because it was probably, it was probably because they didn't fill out enough forms. So they said, <laughs> what we need to do is simplify these forms. So they went to work and indeed they came up with the solution. They provided the solution. It was one thousand pages long on how to reduce two forms to one form. <laughs> All the 
these new regulations placed on uh, everybody who applies for a bill, and they think that's that is is the uh, is, that will be the solution. But uh, that isn't the solution. The solution is get the government out of our lives and off our back and out of our wallets. We are serious, and we are serious, and when we have the clout, what we do is we don't tinker around with a thousand pages to simplify things. What we do is we, we repeal Dodd-Frank is what we do. And another... You, you know, there was another time the Republicans, were, when they were in charge, they passed the Sarbanes-Oxley. It's cost businessmen a, thou, uh, a trillion dollars with new regulation. But that was when the conservatives were in charge. So when we're getting rid of Dodd-Frank, we get rid of Sarbanes-Oxley as well. I am convinced that we're living at a time that an era is ending, and this is significant because you can be depressed at times when you look at what's happened in Washington, you work hard, you come close to victories, you don't have real victories, and it goes on and on. He said, this is too overwhelming, and Washington is, uh, is responding uh, too, too slowly. But the end of an era provides an opportunity. And I'm thinking recently about what era are we talking about? And I would say first off, uh, in the last hundred years approximately, what about 1913? That was a begin that was a beginning of an era. That was that was a beginning of a time where they said, you know, with the income tax and a new foreign policy, we're going to have, we're going to make the world safe for democracy, and we're going to have a war to end all wars, and we're going to have a Federal Reserve that's going to get rid of the business cycle, on and on. This, they, we were going to introduce this wonderful era. Well, guess what? That era is not with us anymore. It's over and done with. We're just looking at the last vestiges of a bad program started in 1913. We will eventually get rid of the Federal Reserve. Also, at approximately that same time, something else was uh, uh, started, and that was the uh, the domination or the oncoming of communism. 1917, the Bolsheviks taking over, and communism was a panacea. It was all done with good intentions. You take care of the people. All those wonderful promises. Well, communism lasted 74 years. It dissipated between 1989 and 1991. People don't uh, talk too much about communism anymore. At the same time, communism brought about is hard to count when it gets up into the hundreds of millions. It is estimated that positively 200 million people died by people who were able to put bad ideas out on the table and look at the tragedy of what happened. That era is over and done with. We are not going to see the world go back to that type of a program again. One of, the, one of the books that impressed me when I was still in medical school was uh, Dr. Shivago. And I remember one line in there when Laura was talking to Shivago, and things were very, very bad uh, during the revolution. And she says to uh, Shivago, what a terrible time to be alive. And she was absolutely right anticipating just what was coming. But I think things are different now. I don't think we should be as depressed. We have more knowledge now than ever before. We also, 
We also had the 1930s, a continuation of the progressive era. We had the Keynesian economic policies take over, the New Deal policies taken over, the fascism of uh, Hitler and Mussolini. And they contributed to another 25 million people that died, just the fascism uh, of Europe. So the 1930s didn't do as well either. And then that, of course, when you have bad economic policy, when you get involved in a war to end wars, it's only a war to begin more wars, and you end up in another world war, we end up, again, another World War II, and then after World War II, we have this internationalism come in. We have the development of the United Nations and the IMF and the World Bank. But they set up, of course, they were working toward uh, worldwide currency, so they set up this uh, Bretton Woods uh, agreement on money, which was a total farce. The good economists, the Austrian economists at that time said, it can't work, it won't work. And indeed, when it fell apart, it was a very, very impressive day for me because like it is tonight, a Sunday evening, it was on a Sunday evening, August 15, 1971, the Bretton Woods uh, monetary system collapsed. But that was predictable, and that's over with. And there are some, there's no doubt, we'd like to go back to that. But it also gives us the uh, wonderful opportunity to advance forward. In more recent history, we have had the advancement of these failed policy. The project for a new American century, that is the... You already know there are a bunch of neocons running that show. They actually opened up an office in 19, uh, 1997. They closed their office in 2006. That doesn't mean they're gone, and that doesn't mean they're not influencing most of the politicians in Washington, but believe me, they're losing steam. Right now, the wars that have been fought in these 10 last years, it's given us $4 trillion worth of debt, are unpopular, we can't afford them, the American people want us out, and they want to bring the troops home. If they don't listen to your shouts, and if they don't listen to common sense, they're going to listen to the facts of life. And the facts of life is, we can't afford it anymore. The Soviets didn't leave because they had an enlightenment. They left because they were broke. And they so foolishly got bogged down in Afghanistan. So why don't we wise up and just take care of ourselves and defend our country and not be the policemen of the world? These conditions that have been developing for the past hundred years, and now we're in the midst of a, of a change, providing an opportunity for a revolution towards liberty, this has provided some very serious problems for us. It will not be smooth sailing, but there's reason to be optimistic that we can have great achievement. But to me, the three problems that we have to face, number one, that I see as the problem that if we solved it, it probably would solve most of the other ones. And that is the attack on personal liberty. Right. If people truly understood what personal liberty means, that you have self-ownership, that you have a natural God-given right to your life, therefore you have a right to your liberty, and we defend all life and all liberty regardless of our judgment about how people are using that liberty, then we would have the natural sequence of saying, if that is the case, you have a natural right to keep the fruits of your labor. And all of it. Personal liberty, when it returns, 
once again, you'll be able to drink raw milk. You'll be able to make rope out of hemp. You will be able to feel secure in your houses that the federal government will not be able to spy on you or bust into your house without a search warrant. You will be allowed, without a government permit, to buy nutritional products when you please and what you please. No longer will government assume they have the responsibility of protecting you against yourself. Nobody can do that. The emphasis will no longer be on economic and personal security. The government will take care of us, but it will be emphasizing the government is there to protect our liberty. You know, they can give us security, you know, whether it's economic, which always fails, or whether it's personal security. But you will become, if, they, if the government said we can provide you perfect security, isn't that what we do with animals that we breed to raise up and eat? I mean, this is what happens. They're secure. You put them in cages and you put them in fields, you fatten them up, you take care of them. They have all the food they want and the best nutrition until it's time to butcher. And this is safe. So what you want is liberty. You don't want this false sense of security that governments cannot give you. true in a free society you can pick your nutritional products and you can make your own choices and you can drink raw milk but you also in a free society you're allowed to make even more controversial choices you might even decide to drink alcohol and uh, and you know there's a little bit of risk in alcohol but in a free, truly free society, they tried that alcohol business one time. It didn't work very well. Too many politicians drank alcohol, so they finally repealed that. <laughs> but yes, you would be allowed to make a decision on what kind of, uh, what, what things you smoke and drink or eat or whatever you do to your own body. <laughs> now, of course the argument is, is what would happen to the world if they had freedom of choice to imbibe drugs and all these dangerous things? Well, why don't you go back and look at early American history up until about 1938 and find out how many people were using these drugs in the 19th century. So once again, it's who gets to make these decisions. But the hardest thing for some people to accept, both liberals and conservatives, on this issue of tolerance of your freedom, yes, we want you to have your freedom, we want you to make your own choices, and we're not going to tell you that you can't make bad choices. People say, well, doesn't that mean you endorse it? What if people drink too much or smoke too much into making their own choices? Well, there's one rule. They have to assume the consequences of their actions totally and completely. under the pretense of taking care of ourselves that we have this drug war. Our government agencies have been known to be involved in drug trades. Government agents have been involved. The law enforcement agencies have been involved. And guess what? Guess which, which uh, industry would like to see marijuana never legalized? That's the alcohol industry. How about the, how about the drug companies that sell, sell all these uh, tranquilizers, they don't want marijuana legalized either. So there's a lot of special interests that would like to, uh, keep, to keep drugs illegal. But the attack then is on our liberties. That is the important thing. We want our freedoms to make these decisions even when the wrong decisions are made. Some people say, well, no, if it's legal, that means we've endorsed it. No, we don't. We don't endorse it. What about on religion? We're pretty good on religious values. Some people choose no religion. Some people 
pick, pick different ones, 10, 20, 30, 50 different kind of religions. But we generally protect that and say that's your own choice, you can make your own choice. We are not judgmental about that. And we're, pr and we're pretty good, but we're getting, uh, you know, uh, we're getting sloppy on it to protect your intellectual freedoms. Now that they want to regulate the internet and uh, arrest people for saying things, this is where we're going to have to be very careful because when the state feels like they're under attack, probably the first freedom they get rid of is freedom of speech. Ideas, spreading ideas. That is why our ideological revolution has to pursue and it has to pursue quickly before they take away our ability to communicate. But it's the ideas that changes the world, so that is why the First Amendment is so crucially important. In the second area that uh, we have uh, a, day, a great deal to be concerned about, and that is economics. We're in an economic mess. It's very, very bad. I am convinced it's worse than anything that we faced. Worse than the Great Depression. Worse than uh, you know, world when we're in uh, uh, major wars. Because the fundamentals, the foundation of our economic system, the understanding of property rights, the understanding of monetary policy, has so eroded that the bubble that still exists is is so huge and it's worldwide. So when we see hints of this break apart you know in Europe are that what's going to happen you know to to the euro and the European community and what's going to happen to us well generally so far with our Federal Reserve and our Treasury and so far our Congress it says well we better be in Europe because our banks over there we don't want to let everybody fail so we have to keep bailing them out and I would say that that eventually is going to bring the downfall of the dollar and the downfall of the economy, which means that there will be more excuses for them to crack the whip and crack down on our civil liberties. This is why understanding civil liberties, individual rights are so crucial in tying it in to monetary policy and property rights because we cannot allow that to happen. The economic system today is based on debt. For too long, what we have done is we've bailed out every attempt for the market to correct the mistakes made, especially since 1971. We've always jumped in and interfered. That is, we spent more money, printed more money, lowered the interest rates, and there seemed to always be a response. Even though the statistics now are showing how devastating this economy and destruction of currency is. The average American family's losing. They know it. It's on the news this week significantly and that is a predictable event. Austrian economics teaches that if a government deliberately devalues and destroys the value of a currency it will destroy the middle class and the wealth will gravitate to the wealthy. That is the reason monetary policy is, is important and the reason that ultimately we get rid of the Fed. People ask, well, haven't we had a uh, accumulation of wealth in the last several decades? Some people have gotten wealthier, but the average person hasn't. And the middle class is smaller; is especially smaller in these past in these past five years. So you print money, and even if they get a GDP to go up, it's represented by the government spending more money on cruise missiles or something, and that doesn't help you. It doesn't help your income. It doesn't help keep prices down. It doesn't help you one bit. And it is so destructive because when the trouble comes and the Fed say, we are all wise, we know what interest rates should be, we know what the cost of money should be, and therefore we're going to make it free. 
And guess who qualifies? The big banks. And they get free money and they loan it back to the governments and they buy the bonds, finance the political system, and they make a lot of money. But what happens to the average person who decides they need to be frugal? Times are tough. Spend less, save more, be prepared, take care of ourselves, act responsibly. Guess what? Instead of getting a market rate of interest, which very well could be five, six, seven, eight percent, they get one percent or nothing. So it is so unfair, and once again, it is biased against the people, protects the big banks, the big corporations, and the politicians. In the other area that we have created a lot of problems for ourselves, and but we're in the midst of a transition, and that is in, on foreign affairs. We're spread too far around the world. We're in 140 countries. We have 900 bases. They're preparing right now to go into Syria, and it probably won't be too long that we may well be in Iran. We don't need another war. We need less wars, and we need to quit. One, one, of the, uh, one of the strongest things that we have to deal with, of course, is the foreign policy uh, as a consequence of the tremendous fear about being attacked by a terrorist. The, the terrorism is a serious, serious, serious uh, subject to deal with, and if you understand the blowback mechanism, of course, uh, we think we can do a whole lot uh, to reduce the threat of terrorism. But right now, uh, the threat of any of us being killed by terrorists about one in 25 million. The odds of getting killed by a car is one in 19,000. Lightning, one in about five million. But guess what? If you're in the military and you have to go over and get involved in a shooting battle to save the world for democracy, make the world safe for democracy, and bring peace and tranquility to these countries, Guess what? The estimates are, and there's no, no precise number, but it's somewhere between 2 and 20 per 100 people, like 2% to 20% that you will be killed by friendly fire. What a tragedy. And they think that we have to, we have, to have a drone warfare, constant, every country. Anybody who suggests they dislike us will send out drone missiles. And uh, guess what? That does not win friends. It does not, not help us in any way whatsoever. It has been said that uh, they were very pleased that we were over there. It was much easier killing us over there than needing to come over here where the Second Amendment is still alive and well. In talking about foreign policy like this and emphasizing blowback, somebody rather nastily said the other day on, uh, on the internet, and they said, oh yeah, if those Paul peoples had been in charge, uh, Osama bin Laden would still be alive. But you know what I think the answer is? So would the 3,000 people from 9-11 be alive. So would the 8,500 Americans who were killed in Iraq and Afghanistan, they would be alive as well. And also, also those 44,000 military personnel who have come back severely injured, they would not be suffering those consequences and we wouldn't have, and we wouldn't have hundreds of thousands 
suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome as well as brain injuries. So I would say if you take that and add in four trillion dollars, our side wins that argument by a long shot. Of course, if we had our way and we remove these dangers, of course, a president would not be able to assassinate anybody, especially never an American citizen. <laughs> then, of course, if we have our way, we would uh, repeal the provision in the National Defense Authorization Act. This whole idea that they've gone all the way back to 1215, the best of one with the progress of liberty and repeal habeas corpus by saying that you don't have uh, any, any right of due process and the military can arrest us and uh, put in private prisons and never get a trial. There's something very un-American about that, let me tell you. There was, when that, when that bill was being debated uh, in, in, in the Senate, there was a provision in there so that actually it looked like it was going to get passed. If the provision said that if we as an American citizen were arrested and we were tried and found innocent in a jury trial, they still claimed that they could put us away for it, forever and held indefinitely in de detention. After found again. But you have, it didn't get that bad. It's still bad, but there, there was a senator, I can't think of his name, I think he was from, I think he was from Kentucky. And, and he was able to stop that. Once it got out on the table, they said, oh, we didn't know that was in there. Of course, that's always possible because they don't have the vaguest idea what they're voting on most of the time. That is a problem, you know, uh, when there's a Read the Bills Act over there, and of course I think that's a proper thing to do, you ought to read the bill. But, uh, you know, I have to admit, I haven't read all those bills. I mean, if they're, if they're a thousand pages long, uh, my staff has good instructions. They say they have an easy job. They say they, all they have to do is show me where, if it's unconstitutional. So a lot of times they only have to read the first page. <laughs> And if there was ever a time if I wasn't well informed or I came quickly and thought, well, I have, maybe haven't thought this through completely, let me tell you, it's always been safe to vote no. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think the uh, important thing that we know in this room and the growing number of Americans are realizing that the worst thing we can do is remain silent. How many times I've been to the campuses, I brought this subject up about uh, military arrests and the problems that we're facing, assassination and torture and all these things. And I said, but how many times, how many times have you read it or heard of, about it on the evening news? I mean, it's almost like there's a silence out there. But I, early on in the campaign, I would bring up, I just sort of say, well, let me tell you a little bit about NDAA and I would uh, think I had to fully explain it. But as soon as I said NDAA, the people in the audience, they were outraged about it. Which means we're not silent, we know about it, but we have to get around the system which will not report on it because they're part of the problem. They're problem part of the military industrial complex. But another accusation that is made quite frequently at me and you is that we're not patriotic. Well, we do know, 
We do know the military supports this because they said that's un-American, you're not patriotic. But all our views are supposed to be unpatriotic. They hide behind this and patriotism is. But I have been taught and I have been convinced that patriotism is that quality that permits us in a free society to criticize our own government when they're wrong. This is why I have a soft spot in my heart for whistleblowers. The whistleblower serves a very good function, but quite frequently, what are they accused of? Treason. Why are they doing this? Why are they releasing this information? So, Bradley Manning, you know? Now, he's, he's in the military, and there are probably some, you know, debate on exactly how and what to do, but let me tell you, Bradley Manley didn't kill anybody. Bradley Manley hasn't caused the death of anybody. And what he has exposed, he is equivalent to Daniel Ellsberg, who told us the truth about Vietnam. And when Daniel Ellsberg was under the gun, they also, the government wanted to crack down on the exposure on the New York Times. The New York Times, you know, uh, printed the uh, material that Ellsberg released, and that went to the Supreme Court. And, uh, and Ellsberg did not go to prison. He, it was upheld, and New York Times did not suffer either, the consequence of this. So we're at this point, but just think right now, I'm afraid that if we took a poll across the country uh, and they say, should, uh, should we try uh, Assange for treason? <laughs> but most Americans are going to say, oh yes, he's a bad guy, he's telling us all these secrets. But guess what? He's an Australian citizen. <laughs> How do you, and you read about it all the time. Uh, that, that, that's a uh, triumph for treason and uh, bring them to the United States. So we have so much power and clout, even Sweden is submitting to saying, well, if he gets here, we'll drum up some false charges and we'll send him over to the United States so he can have a fair trial. <laughs> but those are the kind of things, those are the problems that we need to worry about, that we need to be concerned about, but they're also the kind of things that we can, re we can reverse, and that should be our goal, to change this, to know what a free society is all about, to know where we are and what we need to do. We don't have to invent it. We've had a good taste of it. We don't have to go back to a static period in the 19th century because there were a lot of problems. Even the gold standard can be improved upon. So we want to advance the cause. I think the cause of individual liberty actually started in 1215. It got a tremendous boost with our revolution and our, our constitution. But we don't want to say we're going back. The people who want tyranny, want big government, that's what is ancient and that is what we should worry about. They're the ones who want to go back to the dark ages. So how do we look at today, 2012? Do we look at it like 1913 and it's, it's, we're starting all over again and bringing in a new system? Is it 1917 with the uh, Sovietization and uh, the communization of the world? Is it the 1930s uh, where we had so much fascism and Keynesianism and all the mess we have and, and then uh, the 50s and the, uh, uh, and the advancement or, the, or now are we going to have to live with the neocons or are we going to say we're living in a new era, we're going to start something different, completely different than all that. In, 19, in 1935, uh, Sinclair Lewis wrote a novel, It Can't Happen Here. 
And that novel essentially was a warning because he believed it could happen here. It was an anti-fascist novel because he was very concerned about Mussolini and the Nazis. And his whole argument was that, that it can't happen here. But I would like to turn that around and say it can happen here. What can happen here though, not in the negative sense, there, can happen that we can reverse this. If we don't believe it can happen, it won't have a prayer of a chance. We can turn it around if we put the work and effort into it. Some people, you know, will still be negative and they say, yeah, but how many times have you seen a revolution that really has turned out? You know, all through the 20th century, so many revolutions and wars to wars to end wars and all that. It never happened. And right now we still have neocons all over the place. You know, uh, they, they aren't all in one party either. <laughs> They're in all, both of the, the parties and that's what we have to be challenged. But there have been times in our history where, uh, in the history of the world, where there has been successes. You know, in 1850, uh, the British passed a law. It was called the Repeal of the Corn Laws. And it was an introduction into free market economics, repealing, oh, you know, mercantilism and protectionism and ushered in the age of the Industrial Revolution. And it was a difficult time. Uh, uh, Peel, who was the uh, representative, had this passed. He worked for many, many years. And it was was finally passed and it was smoothly there were a lot of special interests involved but it worked it was smoothly and they transitioned from mercantilism into a much uh, better system you know in uh, 1919 they decided in this country that we were going to take care of the American people to make sure your habits the American people's habits were wise and frugal and so they passed this prohibition of alcohol and it was an absurdity. It didn't work. But what happened by the early 1930s? By 1933, the people rose up and said, this is ridiculous. Prohibition is bad. And they repealed prohibition. So someday we're going to wake up and say the same thing about all drugs and say, and right now we're getting a lot more support for this. Repeal these drug laws. Get rid of the crime associated with the drug laws. In, 19, in 1933, as Roosevelt took over, he ran believing his program in 1932 was balanced budget. He had the most conservative platform because Hoover wasn't doing such a good job. And he said that he would defend the gold standard and balance the budget and cut spending. Well, that didn't exactly happen because the first thing he did was made it illegal for an American citizen to own gold. I mean, that, that uh, really told you something about what was happening. But it was, Ill, it was illegal to own gold all the way up until 1975. Uh, so in 1975, why is gold illegal? And uh, the, the law, a law was passed, and we once again, we moved back in a direction, and the American people could own gold. It's a very important issue in a free society don't give up your right to own precious metal and don't give up your right to own a weapon to defend yourself. But then, then we even made a little more progress because uh, we had not minted any gold coins since the early 1930s. So in 1985, once again, as a consequence of the Gold Commission, one thing that they came out of that, what we came out with, they, they, they would not go along with the views that I had on gold at the time, and they said, well, we'll throw them something, so why don't we go back to minting gold coins again? Far from imperfect, not a gold standard, but it was a big thing. It was a big deal for us to take something minted. It was one of the few constitutional authorities that we have to mint gold and silver coins. So that was restored in 1985. Point being is that it is in, inexorable that we move in the wrong direction. We can start moving in the other direction. And even I, if you would have asked me five years ago that we would get the attention of the nation, 
and that we would get the attention of establishment Republicans, even where they felt compelled to talk about it in the platform, that I never dreamed that we would get attention to probably 75% of the American people say the Fed ought to be audited. So what, what, is our, what is our big challenge? The big challenge is, is can we restore natural rights, God-given rights to our people so that we emphasize the fact that return of liberty can solve so many of our problems. Economic policies means private property, contract rights, gold standard, and get the government out of this business of regulating the market. And property rights regulates quite well. Under those conditions, guess what happens in a free market? They say there'll be no regulations. No, the regulation is if you go bankrupt, you go bankrupt and you don't get bailed out by the government. So the, uh, the really big question I think that we have to decide upon is which way are we going to go? Uh, we see the end of an era, where is it going to go? And I think the choice is one of two. I do not think that there's going to be another Marxist come along and restore enthusiasm for Marxism. I don't think that tomorrow we're going to have the same thing as a Hitler and Mussolini, but I do think we have to worry about fascism, an expansion, an expansion of what we already have, which is corporatism. The buddy system between big corporations, big banks, with the government. And that is the reason that we have to be on the side of saying, yes, if you're big and you made your money because you had special benefits and bailouts and protectionism from the government, that is wrong. But if you're big because you sold a good product to us and we bought it and you got rich, you have a right to be rich for doing that. We do know that ideas do have consequences, and, uh, and ideas, I've often said, as time has come, can't be stopped. I really believe we're here. I think we're here. They're not, going, they're not going to be able to stop us. But we have to learn to know how to spot the fluff, the baloney, and get rid of it. Don't listen to it. But you just can't. You just can't uh, hit them over the head with a, a, a two by four. It seems like maybe that's the best way to do it at times. You know, some people, uh, some people claim that uh, I have not been, an, I don't express my outrage enough. You should be more outraged. Look at what they're doing to you. How did you ever put up with that? What did you do all this? Then they, they'll say to me, how did you ever put it up with this in Congress 30 years? And, and, and you're not yelling and screaming. But have you ever thought about it? What if I became outraged at everything they did wrong? I'd have been worn out in about five years for sure. <laughs> But we do, we do need to sort it out. We do need to know the good ideas from the bad ideas. We do need to persuade people. And uh, politics plays a role in this. And uh, I feel very blessed that I was able to be uh, a professional person, practice medicine, which my wife describes as something I loved and I did. One of the reasons why I went back to my practice after being in Washington for six, seven years. And, uh, I, but, but, uh, Politics is, uh, is, is something that is beneficial uh, if I had not run for Congress. And I consider there's a lot of luck in politics and winning a seat. And I don't think there's any luck in taking your positions. I think that is a freedom of choice and you make those decisions. So, but, but anyways, being in the right place at the right time has a lot to do with it. But I think every one of us has a responsibility because people in an audience like this know and understand the problem. You have more insight than essentially almost everybody in Washington. And I guess that's no challenge. <laughs>
But the difficult task is you have more responsibility. And you say, and a lot of people say, well, and, and even in the introductions today, they talk about sacrifice. I don't, I don't think for a minute I sacrifice anything. I do it out of self-interest. I do it because I think it's good for me. I do it because, well, I enjoy ideas. I enjoy sorting out right from wrong, good ideas and bad ideas. And there's some fun in it. I always advise if you're in this business and you don't try to have some fun, like I hope we do the rest of the evening tonight too, to have some fun, then, it, then you're gonna get, then you're gonna get worn out. But once you come to the conclusion that you put this whole thing together, personal liberty, property rights, sound foreign policy, monetary policy, and then there's an enlightenment. It comes and a light goes on and you say, wow, this, is, this really comes together. So out of your own self-interest, you spread this message, but you first educate yourself, study and learn, and, and learn how to give the answers. And you don't have to worry about what your job's gonna be. If you know the answers and you speak out and, uh, and you're available, somebody will use you. And, and it may be in politics, you may run for office, you may organize, who knows what it'll be. And, uh, but the obligation is there. You have an obligation to do your very best to change this because it's in your interest, in your family's interest, it's the interest of our country. When we do this, we have to we have to aim high. We we have to be very idealistic. We have to use reason, and we have to have passion. We have to have passion for this. This will convert people rather than grabbing them by the collar and saying, "Don't you understand what I'm saying? Listen to me." Doesn't work. I tell you that it just doesn't work. A soft answer sometimes is a lot better. A soft answer in Washington doesn't seem to uh, help too much. But when you're persuading your friends, soft answers and discussion is a good way to uh, convince people. This whole idea of uh, describing it as one unit, that you don't have economic freedom and personal liberty and they're separate, no, it's, it's all one issue. And also, if they get very confused and they say, well, I don't quite understand that, just tell them freedom is popular. That's the reason. Yeah. And the basic, the basic rule of that drives this whole philosophy is the rejection of violence. You don't kill other people, you don't take their property, you tolerate other people. And just think about this for a minute. Freedom should bring us together. It should never be divisive. Because in this room there might be a thousand different reasons why you want your freedom. You might want it for personal reasons, economic reasons, religious reasons, intellectual reasons. But if you all agree on liberty, you don't have to worry what the other guy's doing, the other person, or how they dress, or what they say, or what they do. We all should come together to defend liberty. <laughs> Giving up this initiation of force or violence is very important. I mean, we live with a lot of violence, state violence, police violence, individual violence, and we're in a very violent uh, culture. And I think it's a result, and this is my own theory, I think it, it comes from the fact that welfareism and socialism doesn't generate a sense of self-esteem. And uh, it's, it generates... Instead, instead of generating an a, a understanding and enjoyment of liberty, it generates this idea that somebody owes me something. And uh, this is very negative. And then I think self-esteem comes from production, where you feel good about yourself, that you did something. Now, somebody, some people can, can produce uh, uh, computers, there can be a Steve Jobs. I couldn't possibly be a Steve Jobs, but I bet, I bet he, I bet his satisfaction came as much from producing things as it was for just getting another billion dollars. You know, I just don't think, I don't think that's it. It is self-esteem and confidence. But everybody's self-esteem and confidence from producing comes differently. 
It might be raising a family. It might be doing your job well. You know, you're doing your job well. Various ways. But the self-esteem, to me, seems to be so important. I am convinced that when people lose their self-esteem, they're more likely to do violence to others because they don't even have enough respect for themselves. So injuring others doesn't matter. And maybe those who redistribute wealth suffer from that same problem. Oh yeah, superficially they want to redistribute wealth and take care of everybody, but they too might not have enough self-esteem to understand where, where it really comes from. My, my personal goal with my politics and my personal life is that a free society provides me an opportunity to seek virtue and excellence. And that should be a personal goal. And uh, in doing that, uh, it is better done in a free society. If the government takes over the rule of trying to make you a better person, an excellent person, and make you virtuous, it's all over. It's all over. That, that is the seeds of an authoritarian society. So instead of seeing this as a continuation of an era of the 20th century that gave us so much death and destruction and undermining of our liberties and conditions today that are so dangerous, let us think that we are now moving into a new era, a new era where we're going to concentrate on liberty and freedom and property and peace. I believe that is the cause that we should lead and I thank you very much for being part of it. Thank you.